there are a couple of really useful material properties to talk about when we're looking at a rock sample or a rock mass that allow us to deduce some useful things about it in terms of how it will react to different stresses and strains and just giving us a better idea of what it's doing, right? What at the individual level a mass of rock may be doing within a much larger scale. So the first one to talk about is going to be E, which is your quintessential material property uh, in any introductory material science. This is probably going to be the first thing you hit. And of course, this is the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity. And this is really useful because it's a ratio between the amount of stress that's put on an object and the strain it undergoes. And this is, gives us an idea of how resistant an object might be, at least in one direction, to compression or tension, extension, right? It's going to be sigma over epsilon. And you can choose whatever direction you want there. Let's say, for example, if we apply a loading in the x direction, right? And we can do it in the y direction, in the z direction. And what's really useful about this is we can define it from our stress-strain curve. So if this is sigma and this is epsilon, for a brittle material like a rock, nearly the entire thing is in the linearly elastic region, remember? And then there'll be a tiny little yielding and then boom, fracture. That's the nature of brittle materials versus something like a metal where it'll undergo a whole bunch of plastic deformation during the ductile region and then the necking and all that whatever stuff, you know? But for us here, right, brittle materials Pretty much the entire thing is in the linearly elastic region. So if we can measure the stress right before this breaking point, then we have some sigma value, let's say sigma prime, and some epsilon value, some strain, epsilon prime. We can determine the slope here, and that is E. Now as far as actually doing this goes, in a lab all you need is, well all you need, obviously these things are <laughs> investments, but all you need is a, a compression chamber, you know, some strain gauges and some software to, to connect with it. And then you have, you know, recordings of the strain and the stress ongoing, ideally at pretty frequent time intervals to record the stress and the strain so you can find them. And then once that rock breaks, get your final stress, get your final strain. And then the ratio of those should pretty, pretty easily give you this. And that's gonna be your modulus of elasticity, your Young's modulus. The next one we're gonna talk about today is Poisson's ratio, and that's nu or V. I can never tell which is which. That's, that's a hard one. I like it when Greek letters are easier to, to distinguish from, from English letters. This, this one always gets me. It's like omega and W, you know? But this is the Poisson's ratio, not the poison ratio. And that's gonna be, I'll write it like this. First off, it's a ratio of strains. And that's, well, what does that mean, right? It's some dimensionless number, okay? Well, if we go and look at, let's say, classic rock sample here, cylindrical sample of limestone, sandstone, pick your favorite, and we put this thing in compression, right? We're gonna have a big stress in this direction, the axial direction, we'll call it sigma one. And then let's say we have a smaller confining stress in the radial direction all around it and we'll call that sigma 2. Now think about how the strain is going to react if we think of it as big stress in this direction it's probably going to get compressed and then simultaneously it should expand radially. So we might say we have epsilon 1 going in this direction and then epsilon 2 going outwards here. So the Poisson's ratio, is it epsilon 1 over epsilon 2, epsilon 2 over epsilon 1? Well, it's epsilon 2 over epsilon 1. So that gives you an idea of how much the rock is going to expand outwards uh, when applied, when a certain load is applied to it, let's say just from gravity at a certain point. Um, hydrostatics, you know, rock deep down in the earth. So for most rocks, of course, if you this should be intuitive. For most rocks, this is going to be significantly less than one, right? You would imagine that by crushing this thing, it's going to shrink a lot more in that axial direction than it is going to bulge out in this direction. Hopefully that's intuitive. But, you know, for something like a, a typical sandstone sedimentary rock, this might be anywhere from 0.2 to 0.4, you know, in that really low range. 
Now, another thing to note here is directions do matter. Uh, usually we'll define outward extension strain to be positive negative because it's opposite of what rock would naturally be exposed to in compression, right? So then inward strain, compression, uh, reduction of size is usually going to be a positive strain. So you might say, well, that means that epsilon 2 is negative and epsilon 1 is positive, and I'd say you're absolutely right. So we'll usually put an absolute value bar around that. And that, of course, is, once again, a dimensionless value. You'll look over here at Young's modulus, of course, if we think of it as a stress value over a strain value. Strain is itself valueless, right? It's in meters per meter, feet per feet, whatever you want. So this, the units of this become identical to units of stress, uh, which are units of pressure, which is force per unit area. So for rock purposes, we're probably going to be looking at MPA or KSI. And for a sandstone, that could be pretty high. You know, obviously some rocks are going to break a lot earlier and they might be going down more like this. The one thing to keep in mind with material properties and rocks is everything's going to be in really wide ranges, right? Because a sandstone that is mostly pure sandstone or a rock that's maybe limestone mixed with sandstone, you know, pretty cohesive sedimentary stuff is going to be vastly different from, let's say, a sedimentary rock that has a huge amount of clay minerals in it. And that's going to be hugely different from uh, a strongly metamorphosed gneiss that's going to be a lot stronger generally. So there are just a whole bunch of things to consider here with rocks. And then even within types, there's huge variations. So sandstones could be anywhere from, you know, maybe high numbers of the MPAs to uh, tens of gigapascals. Um, and of course, you know, you can convert that to KSI if you want. You know, some of us are here in the States where we use that kind of stuff. But those are two of the most basic material properties. Other ones to talk about might be a uh, bulk modulus, uh, the shear modulus, those kinds of things. But these two can be used to find those um, in most cases. And these are very fundamental, just useful things to know, especially this right here, just as a very foundational, not just for rock mechanics, but for material science all around. Just super basic, useful stuff.